Rob Dolce here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Bill 68 till I die. Oh. I'm sorry, man. I blacked out. Randolph Children. DJ Khaled. You know the big DJ Khaled guy? Hands grow up and in. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Tasker. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. Drink responsibly tonight. I'll be drinking with you. Jarrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Feel the 68. After that. Good evening, everybody. On this Wednesday, November the 1st, 2023, we welcome you to the Feel the 68 After Dark. This is is our bold predictions show. We will be offering bold takes to come over the next hour, but we begin with the breaking news of this evening. I'm John Fanta, Rob Dowster's here, Jeff Goodman's here, Terrence Oglesby is here as well. Bob Knight, the man most synonymous with Indiana basketball and a 1991 Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame inductee, died today. He was 83 years old. The Knight family made an announcement tonight on social media. It's with heavy hearts that they shared the news. Grateful for all the thoughts and prayers. Bob was a beloved husband, father, coach, and friend. He ranked sixth all-time in college basketball history with 902 victories, led the Hoosiers to national titles in 1976, 1981, and 1987. Two other Final Four appearances as well, and won a national championship while a player at Ohio State in 1960, playing alongside John Havlicek and Jerry Lucas. Let's react to this breaking news. Jeff Goodman, I'll start with you. When you think of Bob Knight, his legacy, his mark on college basketball, what comes to mind? I mean, greatness first, right? One of the greatest coaches of all time. Um, but he was complicated. He, he was so controversial. Uh, because of how he did it. And again, one of the things I always think of with Bob Knight, a lot of people can say, well, you know, they think of that iconic moment when he threw the chair, how tough he was. Well, when you talk to any of the guys who played for Bob Knight, and it's the same with a lot of these old school coaches, Jim Calhoun, Bob Knight, um, some of these other guys, they'll say they hated Bob Knight when they played for him. Absolutely hated him. But when they were done playing, they loved him. He was revered because the lessons, the accountability, the fact that, again, he he made them, he prepared them for life. He, he was a guy who, when he did it, he didn't cheat. He did it the right way. He graduated his players. Again, obviously, he was a great basketball coach, but he did things certainly to rub people the wrong way. You know, he, he wasn't touchy-feely. Uh, but spending some time lately with Pat Knight, his son, I got some of those stories, the funny stories, some of the things you don't generally hear. And, you know, even Pat Knight getting emotional, talking about his dad. And I still, you know, I played it tonight, senior night, when Bob Knight said, you know, my favorite player ever was, was Patrick Knight. And he walked off the court and you could see he was getting an emotion. He was getting emotional and a tear kind of ready to go down his face. So, um, yeah, I mean, listen, th there'll never be another like Bob Knight, period, ever. I Rob. think the perfect way to, to phrase it, Goodman, is, is complicated, right? He was um, a bully, and he was also one of the most brilliant basketball coaches that we've ever seen that quite literally uh, created a platform and created a playbook for an entire generation of basketball coaches. Um, he was a guy that... Uh, maybe didn't treat people the, the the best way that was maybe not as disciplined as he needed to be off the floor while also demanding perfection from his players on the floor and and getting it for a long time as one of the greatest coaches that we've ever seen. And, um, you know, I, the, the one thing that I am happy with is that uh, he was able to reconnect with Indiana, right? The falling out that he had after he's lost his job there uh, was something where um, – he held a grudge for a long, long time. And Mike Woodson, now the the head coach at Indiana, was able to uh, facilitate him coming back to the place where he is beloved and revered. And um, once you get to that age, uh, you know, I think you can get to the point where you let bygones be bygones. And I'm glad that he was able to, in the final years of his life, be able to be celebrated in a place where he created his lasting legacy. Yep. 
I agree with both you guys. I think absolutely complicated is the way to go. Now, all of that being said, he was almost out of the game by the time I was in college. He was on the last leg of his career at Texas Tech, but, uh, you know, tough. I've heard some people say great things. I've heard some former players say absolutely terrible things. So complicated would be the right thing to say. Uh, but on a lighter note, an absolute quote machine when it came to a lot of different things on a lighter note, I understand the severity of what we're talking about, but some of his favorite, some of the, my favorite things that have come out of a coach's mouth have come from Bob Knight and the ask to brain theory is top of that list. Ask goes to bench, bench to ass, ask to brain, brain says, I better go out and play harder. So there's a lot of, there's, a lot of complications with his legacy, but nobody's arguing his validity as one of the best X's and O's coaches of all time. There's so much history that he shaped, Jeff. So, so many things that he did, so many stories that are coming out tonight about him. I, I'll, I'll never not be amazed at the fact that Mike Krzyzewski played for him at Army. And that linkage, that bond, you're talking about two men who the history of this sport cannot be told without them. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, obviously amazing that Coach K played for Bob Knight. You know, Knight coached uh, West Point uh, for six years, then obviously went on to, to Indiana to do great things, win those three national titles. You know, last team to to run the table from start to finish in, in 76. Um you know, I, I think it was hard the last few years too. Rob Rob said it, and and I remember talking to Pat about this when he walked into Assembly Hall. You know, two and a half, three years ago. You know, Pat was worried that whole week. I talked to him leading up to it, and I talked to him afterwards, and and he was worried how Pat was. I mean, how Bob was going to be because it was early dementia at that point. Uh, his health has not been great for a few years, but he said something clicked that day, and uh, and before. Bob Knight said to him, he said, all right, I'll, I'll do it, but are there going to be any assholes there? And uh, and Pat said, yeah, there are probably going to be some assholes there. He said, but I'll take care of them. Don't worry, Dad, I'll take care of them. <laughs> and, uh, again, he was just a, a, a different, complicated, old-school guy. I'll, I'll give you a great story, funny story. Uh, I go out, and I didn't know him well at all. I was young, um, breaking in, and – Jay Billis invited me after a game at the Garden one night uh, to go out with with me, uh, Bob Knight, and there was a fourth person I can't even remember, to be honest. And uh, we went to a deli. It was late. It had to be like 1 in the morning. We got into a, a deli in New York, and, uh, and I'm sitting directly across from Bob Knight. And we had dinner for probably 90 minutes right across from him. He didn't say one word to me the whole night. Not one word. And I was so intimidated. And and he honestly was the most intimidating person, coach, I've ever been around in any sport, in any level. I was there in Texas Tech in Lubbock um, when he tried to set the record. He, he didn't do it the first time. And I was there. And I remember asking a question post game, and I was shaking. And again, like I'm not usually intimidated by too many of these these coaches. But Bob Knight just had a different feel to him. You knew, again, if you asked the wrong question, he was going to bite your head off. You better know. And even if you ask a great question, he could still bite your head off. But, uh, again, um, he was just one of those guys who was kind of larger than life in a lot of ways when it came to college basketball. That's an amazing story. I've never seen you get intimidated by any coach. And yeah. he just Bob, had that presence. Bob Knight. Yeah. Bob Knight. Bob Knight uh, passing away at the age of 83. You can stay tuned to our coverage at the Field of 68. There'll be reflections to come in the coming days on our various podcasts and platforms on what Bob's legacy means to the sport of college basketball. He is one of the all-time great, sixth all-time in college basketball wins as a head coach. What a career. Bob Knight, dead at 83. May he rest in peace.
Big news. The Almanac is officially back. The most exhaustive and comprehensive guide to the 2023-24 college basketball season is available for pre-order now. If you go to cbbalmanac.com, link is in the description below, you can pre-order for just $15.99 or 20% off the sticker price. The format is going to be a little bit different this season. Instead of an 850-page PDF, you'll be getting access to the full site with league-by-league PDFs available for download. The preview will be live on September 20th, so you have until then to be able to get your pre-orders in. So for insight for all 362 Division I teams from their head coaches and the experts that cover them, make sure you hit that link. Are you a college basketball junkie? Are you the kind of fan that gets frustrated that this beautiful sport has such a lack of national coverage outside of the month of March? Well, let me tell you about the Field of 68, an all-encompassing digital network of podcasts, live streams, and newsletters that cover the sport at every level on every platform. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid-majors, the only way to keep up with college basketball is through the field of 68. Welcome back to the field of 68 after dark. Night three of us being back. It's been a great week already. Last night, Jeff, Doug Gottlieb, and Jeff Borzello had the Hot Seat Show. If you haven't seen that yet, check it out on our podcast feed. Check it out on YouTube. Tonight, folks, is about the bold predictions. Will we go off the rails this hour? The answer to that question is yes. Are you going to hold us to these takes all season? You're probably going to do so, and you'll be in our mentions all year. So we're going to kick things off. We're not wasting any time on this show. And I'm going to begin with Terrence Oglesby, who has been a hot take artist this week already. We're going to get to that. (laughs) You think? We're going to. Hey, Tio, you want to revisit the dumb hot take you had? I'm bringing it back, and I'm defending it even more. I'm defending it even more. The ACC is going to be the second-best conference in college basketball. And before you all just go ahead and say, hey, look, you're just full of nonsense, I went back and did a deeper dive. I've got 10 teams (laughs) out of that league that will be on the bubble at some point this year. And I'm going to go through them. And before you guys just go ahead and just brush this off, I want you to find good reasons to tell me this isn't true. Duke, Miami, Clemson, North Carolina, Virginia. That's five right there. I think they're all going to go to the tournament. I think you guys would agree. The more we look at it, the more we like it. Find a reason why Wake Forest doesn't get there. Cam Hildreth is there. They've been able to have Hunter Salas, and Forbes has done a good job of getting better, getting guys that haven't done well at older spots coming in and being that guy. Virginia Tech has Mike Young, Sean Padula, who's one of the best on the ball scorers in that league. And when you're one of the best on the ball scorers in that league, you can get buckets. NC State's going to come back once more. They have all kinds of talent. I'm a fan of Kevin Keats and the kind of pieces that he put together. And throw in Syracuse, who has all the talent in the world. How's it going to be with Red Autry? That's to be determined. All of that being said, them, and I'm throwing one more in there, Pitt with some young guards. I think it's possible they make it back to the NCAA tournament. Look, they got Blake Henson. They have the Guillermo Diaz (laughs) brothers coming back. There's your hot take. And I started looking at other leagues just because. And I started blowing up your guys' phone on text messages just because. So let's look at the Big East, shall we? Marquette, UConn, and who's your third? Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Who's your third? Who's your third? Give me another one. Great. Villanova? I don't care. Pick any of them. Rick Pitino? Yeah, Rick Patino. Have you seen his roster of misfits that he's brought there? Joel Soriano is the only Misfit. guaranteed high major dude. I don't want to hear crap you guys are talking about. They're not going to be that good. They're going to look good in the Big East because it's not as good as it was last year. Big hey, East was hey, terrific Gio. last year. Fan, it's high in his underwear. He's going to be in his underwear by the end of the show. Over substance. Give me three teams in the Big East that I love. After that, it's a whole bunch of meh. That's all it is. T.O., shut up. going to be much better this year. You see it? <laughs> hey, Fanta, I realize you work for Fox. Go ahead and just pack your bag, son, because we can go toe-to-toe every team there. Look at that thumbs up right there. That's what's going to happen. Do not. It, that is enough. I'm the host of this show, and I'm not supposed to be delivering minutes on minutes it takes, but I'm going to say in 30 seconds, if you're going to die on this ACC hill of 10 yeah. teams – 
10, for oh, your t- I didn't say 10 teams would get in. I said team 10 teams have a chance to get in. I think it'll end up being seven. Yeah, right. everybody's I a think candidate. It'll be seven yeah, you expi- did you expand the field to 96? For heaven's sake. No, not yet. But <laughs> once we do that, we're looking at 12. Give me yeah. eight teams out of the ACC getting to, to get into the tournament. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that take, and I want to get to Jeff and Rob's takes. But if you're fighting, like you're fighting with by arguing against the Big East, which Jeff That's all the people had the best for the ACC. Here's my issue, and this is a hot take for later, is you got a bottom two that are just going to kill the metrics. And that's not all that people look at anyway because the people choosing the tournament don't know hoop. They just look at numbers. So that's a huge issue. So you have Louisville, who's shat the bed already, and the season hasn't even freaking started. And then yep. you're going to have Notre Dame, who's in a new kind of situation. Those two teams are really going to hurt your metrics. That's the case against the ACC. I hate this so much. I have balloons. <laughs> I have balloons going through my computer right now. <laughs> okay. Let me attempt to get this back you on track. The balloons, I, Dio. You I don't the know balloons. where I don't know what happened to your computer, but you have random animations it, that our crew I updated my our crew has and no got control all kind of over any of this extra. stuff. Yeah, that's not Dagan Hughes. Okay. So now, well, I don't understand anything. I mean, Jeff, Jeff, what is your hottest take? What's I mean, your hottest it can't take? Can't be as hot as that, right? Like, hey, like anything we what's say. What's your medium take? What's your medium spice be, take? It's going to be cold compared to that crap. <laughs> but I, I'm going to go with one. I'm going to go with the fact that Villanova is going to win the national title again. Who <gasps> third? The third time since 2016, and there you go. Big East, uh, Villanova. You know, think about this. If Jay Wright this coaching roster, games too? If you put this roster with Jay Wright coaching, none of you would even think twice about if I said that. Right? Am I wrong? Agreed. Look at that roster. Agreed. To- totally agree. Really good roster. Right? Really good. We're not seeing Mark Armstrong on there. We're not seeing Lance Ware. They've got depth. They've got experience. They've got balance. They've still got those guys that are around from the culture, Justin Moore and Eric Dixon. They've been there a while. Now, again, I understand. I understand people killing Kyle Neptune last year. I think it was completely unjustified. The guy didn't have a point guard. He didn't have a point guard. He also didn't have his freshman, Cam Whitmore, for the preseason and early in the season. You cannot win without a point guard. Now he's got Justin Moore back, Mark Armstrong with a year under his belt. And again, Bamba can score from the wing. Tyler Burton was a really good player at Richmond for four years. Hakeem Hart was a solid player at Maryland. Lance Ware, again, Dixon. But but the thing is, Neptune did a really good job, by the way, his first year at Fordham. People forget that. He just was, was dealt a hand that I don't care if Jay Wright was coaching last year. He wasn't winning with that group, especially in the first part of the year. I love the yeah. take. I love the take. Here's the thing. The talent's I'm there. Fan. I work for Fox. Yeah. <laughs> Terrence, Terrence, you're doing two games for Fox next week. I am. You're right. I mean, but, that, but it's you not are. the only conference I'm working for. That's all I'm saying, Fanta. I'm saying we got we to make sure we stay neutral here. I mean, Villanova has the pieces, the pieces to make a very deep run in March. And Jeff just said it. I mean, the only question about this team is whether or not Kyle Neptune can get them all to come together. And part of the criticism was unjust last year. You went from Ryan Archidiacono to Jalen Brunson. What are they doing now in the NBA? To Colin Gillespie to no one. To Chris Argentiacono, that was a right, joke last right. year. And your yeah. best player was out for the majority of the season. The, like they clean, they didn't, they didn't do okay in the transfer portal. Yeah. They hit a grand slam in the transfer portal. Because yeah. guess what they did? They called a bunch of wine and cheese donors who stacked up a ton of NIL money and said, We got to do what we got to do. Jay Wright's calling us for money. You gonna give him money? Hell yeah, you're going to. You're not saying no to him. Yeah. All That's right, what Rob. There. What's your hot take? Well, it's going to make T.O. exceptionally 
upset, but my hottest overall take is that Providence is going to finish as a top three team in the Big East. They're going to finish as a top 15 team in America. And, spoiler alert, I have them making the final four. <laughs> Whoa. Ho, ho, ho. Yeah, that's hot, all right. That is hot. Yeah, that is a hot take. I'm, I'm loading up the pressure on that's uh, a hot take on not for a Kimmy English. <laughs> on, not, not on Kimmy English. On Kim or English. Kimmy. We got to get it right, Jeff. He's not Kimmy anymore. I He's changed Kim it in English. my phone. Hey, I changed it in my phone after we were done with him. It's Kimmy. <laughs> it's back to Kimmy. It's back to Kimmy. And, All right. Well, yeah. no, here's the, my, my, my take on that is just that it is, it's a veteran team. They have two of maybe like the five or six best players that are coming back in the Big East. They have a guy who could end up being the Big East player of the year in Bryce Hopkins, who was playing at a Big East player of the year level last year uh, before everything the, the wheels kind of came off in, in, in mid-February. I think Guardway Duwall is going to be someone that really stands out this season. I think he really fits a role well with that team, the athleticism, um, the defense that he's going to bring. And Josh Adoro, to me, is a guy that is a really good fit as a kind of small ball, space the floor five man in the big east um they have role players they have veterans they have some talent that they can throw in there some youthful talent i think duwall is going to end up being an nba guy one day so um it's out there it's a hot take i know but i do think that providence is a team that is being uh really undervalued this year nationally wow now that, they're both going is... over there, but they both have talent. They both have talent. I, it, all jokes aside, I'm giving Fanta a hard time, and obviously I'm giving Rob a hard. Look, both teams are going to. Both teams are very talented. Villanova has dudes. I, I just wonder how long it's going to take. Kyle Neptune's got no excuses now. If something happens at this point and mm -hmm. they don't win, there's no excuse at this point because that roster is loaded. Providence. Got to put those pieces together. We still have to wait and see. I love Kim English. I, I had their game when, when he was at George Mason. They played at Dayton last year. I think he's great. He gets his guys together. The people love playing for him. Uh, I, I'm excited to see. I think Final Four in year one at Providence, is that is spicy. That is very spicy. It's the bold prediction show. What do you want me to do? Come out here yeah, and say, that's I spicy. think Kansas is going to be the best team in college basketball. I think Hunter Dickinson yeah. is going to play really well for Bill Self. It's called that's the true. bold predictions. Not the accurate yeah, prediction. Come on, T.O. Let's right. have some fun. Let's get weird. Uh, bold, bold predictions that are intelligent. I mean, there have been some bold predictions that have been that have been intelligent. Then there's we the prediction that the Atlantic, yeah, that the Atlantic Coast Conference is number two in college basketball. All right. Pretty sure Here's they beat the Big Ten last year, who was widely who who was widely considered to be the second best conference in college basketball, and they beat them right. in the challenge. So keep gotcha. keep going. Hey, leave it to me, Terrence, to not give a hot take about a Big East team. There we All go. Right? Here we go, Fanta. There we go. Mama Hog hasn't gone to bed yet, and she's about to fall in love with me. <laughs> For the first time since 1995, I am predicting that the Arkansas Razorbacks will go to the Final Four. I love this team. They've got the mix of returning experience and a blend of newcomers. Mustbus is always going to be able to cruise through the transfer portal. And I'm betting on Trayvon Brazil. I'm betting on Devo Davis. I'm betting on the kids that they brought in and cleaned up with in the transfer portal. I like what I see out of Chandler Lawson. I think L. Ellis is only going to get better there. Tremont Mark fits Arkansas. Tremont Mark was such a a good acquisition by Eric Musselman because in a lot of ways, Houston and Arkansas and how hard they play are the same. Caleb Battle, you know, th this is stop number three for him. He is a guy that that is a bucket getter and is a high-level scorer. So all the trajectory has been there. We don't talk about this enough in the sport that before 1996, fellas, excuse me, before 2021, the last time Arkansas, Jeff, had been in the second weekend of the NCAA tournament was 96. They've now done that three consecutive years. Why can't the Razorbacks make it all the way to a Final Four? No, they, they can. Uh, again, they, they have a hell of a coach. They've got depth. The only thing I worry about is their perimeter shooting. I don't know if they've got great perimeter shooting, uh, but collectively they've got eh, good perimeter shooting. 
but yeah, Mama Hog, man, if they make the Final Four, uh, we're bringing her to, to Phoenix. We're going to bring her out to the clubs in Scottsdale. We're going out partying with Mama Hog. You can't hang with Mama Hog. <laughs> You cannot hang with Mama Hall. It's not it. Come on, man. Imagine, who, who are we kidding? Imagine here? bringing her to Scottsdale to those clubs. My God. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I, look, I, I love, I love it. They're, they're my biggest concern. It's not the, it's not the, uh, it's not the shooting. I think that the shooting is going to figure itself out. Um, it's going to be how long it takes must to figure out like what works with this group, right? Like you see that kind of same cycle every year with the must bus is they start out. Okay. They have a slump in December and January starts putting some stuff together and then come, uh, come February, they turn it on. They figure it out. He, he discovers who like his mismatch guy is. He discovers who his defender is. He discovers what actions are working and they kind of figure it out and put it together. And, and that's why they make those runs in March. How long is that going to take? And is it going to allow them to have a good enough seed where, you know, they're not going to end up playing a one or a two seed in the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. I think that guy is going to be Khalif Battle. I think he's going to be the guy that uh, ends up being their go-to player down the stretch of games. I think Devo Davis needs to make, take a big step forward at the point guard spot. Um, but there, there are a lot of pieces there. And you know what's the most exciting part about it is they can run out of lineup with four guys that are 6'4 to 6'6 six, six, with Trevon Brazil at the five spot. That is a kind of switchable, aggressive, athletic, long defense that Musk loves. I really like this group ceiling. Mm. Yep, yeah, hard to argue. I, I think it, for all those reasons those guys said, I, I don't see why not. I, and the crazy part is, is I think they're the third best team in that league. I think Tennessee and Alabama are ahead of them. So, like, that's the whole thing about the SEC and how good that league is, too. And, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, you got You yeah. got Tennessee, Alabama, and Arkansas over, all three over Texas A&M? I think Texas A&M is really good. I want them to win the league because I like buzz, but I, I think they're right there in that top four or five. It, it's all interchangeable. I haven't quite looked at the SEC, but I think Tennessee and Alabama are both better, but I also know how good a freaking coach Muss is when it comes to tournament time too, after he figures out his rotations and everything. So there's a lot to be said for that. I like how T.O. just said, I haven't quite looked at the SEC when we literally did our I SEC. I have looked at the SEC. I have looked at the SEC, but I just didn't number them down. But, yeah, I have them in groups. <laughs> Let's transition. Here we go. Okay, there's one of these teams in the SEC, and I have a feeling somebody is going to deliver a hot take about them. This is our bold take show. Hey, if you've got a bold take and you're in the YouTube chat or you're on X right now, please comment. We want to hear yours. Maybe we'll read a couple on the air here before we're done. All of Friartown is on fire right now because of what Rob Dalster said about <laughs> Providence. But give us a hot take. We want to hear it from you tonight as well. Let's get to the Blue Bloods. Okay. Rob Dalster, you're hot with Providence. Your Blue Blood hot take is... You, you really had to go to me first on this one because I'm going to get lit up for it. But... Uh, I think that heading into the season, UConn is ranked higher than they probably should be at the start of the year. They're fourth on Ken Palm, they're fifth in the coaches poll, they're sixth in the AP poll, and they're eighth in the Almanac. Take? And I think it's going to take no, a, a little bit take. more time. It's a horrible I'm thing. Can we, can we buzz? Dagan, do we have like a buzzer for a shitty <laughs> hot take? It's not a hot take. No, there's not a – you cannot have a shitty hot take. It's the point of the take. Listen, here, th you this did. is why – You just that. had one. I'm, we I'm, all panned it. We all panned it. Three of us buzzed you out. Well, that's fine. Right, I, I mean, you could pan it. I don't think anyone here knows the UConn program better than I do. So, I'll, I'll, let me just phrase it like this. I'm They're worried about – Higher the than they should be? I mean, what, what, yeah, what is I, that? I, what is I that? Don't think that a top 10. I, I don't think that they're a top 10. Like, what do you what, – what, Yes, they are. They're fourth on Kemp. I want something good. Today. I want some teeth to it. I want something real, Bobby D. Come on. <laughs> good. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> good <relax. laughs> if, I, if, I, if I flip them off, like what's going to happen? Am I going to get – T.O., can you try that see what happens when you flip uh, somebody okay. off? Based, on, I want to based on what you did last year in Vegas with me and we stayed on the air, nothing's going to happen if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so – no, but look, here's 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 why I think that. It's the I think that the fact that they're losing Andre Jackson is gonna impact what they are defensively a lot more 
been people are realizing. He did so much for that group, so much for him defensively, so much for them as a ball mover. It's the instinctual plays that he made. Um, I, I like Steph Castle. I think Steph Castle is going to be a very good player in time. I think he's going to be a really, really good pro. I think it's going to take him a little bit of time to get there. Um, and I'm worried about what they're going to be defensively. I think if you look at their 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 best five, Tristan Newton, I don't think you say that he's like a, a plus above average athlete. Cam Spencer is a good positional defender. I don't think he's a, a necessarily an above average athlete. I don't know if Alex Caravan's an above average athlete. Donovan Klingon can take up a lot of space. I don't know if you would call him an above average athlete. So I'm a little bit worried about what happens if teams can kind of isolate them on the perimeter and beat them, uh, beat them off the dribble. And then you got a seven foot three guy that you're kind of building your defense around that's got a foot problem heading into the season. Like, there's there's things that I think they got to figure out now they got national title upside but it, I think it'll take a little bit more time to get to that level that they were at last season than that what than it did last season that makes hey sense. hey next week on top dogs Doster picks up hey sorry we couldn't get a hold of Hurley this week but we're gonna talk about <laughs> you know you're definitely not getting a hold of Hurley this week I I, I agree with that thing I think they went from really old really experienced really talented to young and super duper talented but in today's day and age it kind of makes it hard right I, I think that's my biggest worry and Cam Spencer's a really good player a really good college player that ain't Jordan Hawkins and that's not taken mm-hmm. away from anything. I, he, Jordan Hogg is first with top, what, 20 pick? So, like, that's not taken away from right. Cam Spencer. He's going to be a really good player for UConn. But uh, I, I, national title, I think, is a little heavy for, I mean, obvious reasons. But they go they're, – they're just so young. And I think it's going to take them time to adjust. And when all that stuff happens, you don't get the seed that in the NCAA tournament that you probably would if you were really good from the get-go, if that makes sense. Hmm. Well, their non-conference has challenges to it, too. Not that last year's didn't, but the fact they got to play in the Empire Classic against Indiana, if they win that game, it's going to be Texas. They've got to play Gonzaga out in Seattle. Uh, They've got North Carolina at the Garden. So that Mm -hmm. that non-conference schedule has its fair share of challenges. We'll see how they're able to handle it. But there's the UConn Blue Blood take. You forgot the best one. They got they got Kansas in the fog. They got Kansas in the fog, and I'm not. That's going to be that's an uphill battle. I mean, that is an uphill battle. Great game. Credit to the Big Twelve and Big East for assembling that game. But that non-conference schedule to go from Kansas at the fog to Carolina at the Garden. That is some wild non-conference scheduling that's taking place, and we'll see how a new-look team handles that. Part of it is you want to acknowledge them as the national championship team from a year ago, but you have to acknowledge what they lost. They lost three terrific players, two NBA draft picks and all-time big in Sonoga. All right, let's let's switch things up. Goodman, your blue blood hot take is? UCLA does not make the NCAA tournament. Wow. That's a hot take. Yeah. That's wow. a hot take. I mean, right? I mean, listen, Jaime Hawkes is gone. Tiger Campbell's gone. Amari Bailey's gone. Jalen Clark's gone. David Singleton's gone. Right now, their point guard is what? Dylan uh, what's Andrews? Right? Is yep. that his name? Dylan Andrews. Andrews. Yep. Dylan Andrews, mm-hmm. the, the sophomore who barely played last year a little bit. Uh, Adam Bone is their best player. He's coming off. Uh, injuries. He he really didn't do anything all pre all uh, off season, and, and he's not a, exactly a guy who's been a powerhouse scorer. Tough as hell. Love him. Rebounder, defender, play hard, all that. They've got three freshmen that Mick Cronin loves. I don't know any of them. You guys know any of them? You seen them? You seen them? Have they played over here? No, they have not. Berke Bayuchtoch, so or whatever his name is, I can't pronounce it. Uh, Jan you Bide, didn't tell. six five. Point guard. I know you actually kind of might have got that right. Uh, and then a die Mara, a day Mara, <laughs> a die, um, a die Mara, Jan V day, and Burke Buchenshaw. Do your fucking homework, man. Come on. I'm just calling Burke. Why do you got to drop profanities? Why do you got to get all you know, in honor of Bob a, Knight? This is a PG show in honor of Bob Knight. Make you it go. Good show. Yeah, we're in honor I mean, of Bob Knight. On. Fine. Folks, this is the they only never. time all year that the four of us work together on a show. Continue, Jeff. <laughs> all right. Anyway, to, to get back to it, they, 
all I'll say is there's a lot of unproven commodities uh, on this team. There's a lot of youth on this team. There's a lot of guys, and they may be super talented, but they're coming over here from other countries, and they've got to adapt to other things, not just basketball. It's going to take them a while. They've also, again, got a point guard who we have no idea how good he is in, in Dylan Andrews. Uh, the kid from Utah, the transfer, Lazar Stefanovic, can, can shoot it, but, you know, can he be a dude? I, I don't – there's just so many questions with this team, and I'm not sure it's a Mick Cronin-type team also. So I'm saying UCLA, they're going to play in that new – the new NIT. Dan Gavitt's going to be psyched because he's going to get the Bruins, a blue blood, in the NIT this year. Man, you're not welcome in Westwood. You are, you're 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 not saying. welcome in Westwood. I'll take. Yeah, I'll take. all 30 fans that are showing at that game anyway. Uh, <laughs> so that part's that part's true. That's not a hot take. That's true. There's a lot of things to do in Los Angeles. Uh, my only my only way to combat there is I, I think the way Mick coaches and the way he likes to slow the tempo down, the way he likes to take the air out of the ball a little bit. His freshmen are going to be in a lot of games because they're big freshmen. They're big ball handlers. And like, there's a lot of length on that team. That all being said, I, I do think it might, it's going to be a tougher year than normal for UCLA. Look, there's a whole lot of new and Jaime Jaquez and Tiger Campbell accounted for so much of what that yeah. program has done the last couple of years that yes, the, the, yeah. the, there's a lot of validity to saying, yeah, we, we don't know exactly what they're going to be. And the top of the PAC 12 has some really good teams with, with major yeah. upsides, not just Arizona, USC should be pretty good. Colorado should have a very strong season. All right. We did Rob. We've got Goodman. Where is Terrence Oglesby going? Where with oh, his boy. blue blood hot take. Oh, hey, North Carolina who I was on all last year, I was really negative, make it back to the Elite Eight. I think some of the additions that they have, Cormac Ryan, I am a massive fan of. Harrison Ingram is a ball mover and a really good player. He's not the defender Leaky Black is, but he's a really freaking good player. And I think the addition of Elliot Cadeau uh, really gives them another gear with their quickness. And that's saying a lot because R.J. Davis is a fast dude. And... Now you're going to be able to put a lineup out there with two point guards that are quick on quick. Both of them are exceedingly fast. They both are not afraid to push the ball up the sideline and get rid of the ball and pass it. And you're going to have an extra few guys that can create. I think Cormac Ryan's a lot better than people give him credit for. I am a massive Cormac Ryan fan, and I think he fits into what they're going to do seamlessly. Uh, North Carolina, after not making the uh, NIT, will be going to the Elite Eight. Ooh. this year bye I, I mean i agree with that I, I i agree with that wholeheartedly we talked about it on uh a monday night so i won't go into too much depth on this but i think that caleb love leaving was a divorce that needed to happen on both sides i think they're both going to be better off for it i think that rj davis is going to be able to step into a bigger role i think that they put the pieces they needed around armando baycott to be able to uh, maximize his skill set and I like the the transfers that they brought in in theory now we need Harrison Ingram to kind of you know hit what his ceiling could be you need Elliot Cadeau to be able to step in here as a uh, a freshman that is reclassifying and be able to have an immediate impact as a point guard that doesn't always happen but on paper I love it I think they have a really good chance to be good and I think that um, the parting with Caleb Love ended up being something that would be better for all parties involved so I'm I'm totally with you there, TL. That is the that's the first take that you've had today that I agree with. That's saying a lot. All right. Yeah. <laughs> My blue that blood hot take. My blue blood hot take. A year ago, when we were doing this very show on the DTF podcast, the mentions were on fire because of some of my analysis of Jeremy Roach. So I am going a different way, a different avenue. I'm turning the car onto a different street, and I want to get your guys' thoughts here. Duke's best player this year will not be Kyle Filipowski. Duke's best player will be a guy that's, when it's said and done, 
will be a top five pick in the NBA draft and will be their best player and will lead them to a national championship. Tyrese Proctor. I'm all in on the Proctor Not a hot train. Take. Not a hot take. I actually think a lot of people would agree with you with that. Like, they're close. I mean, again, obviously looking at the numbers, it is a hot take because Filipowski had such an incredible year last year. And he looked good in their scrimmage recently. But I think everybody in Doster was probably driving the train the earliest here on the Proctor deal pretty much right when the season ended last year that he was going to be the guy this year. He was going to be a dude and uh, and maybe their best player. And I, I think he's their best overall player because of what he can do defensively, because he can make people better, because he can score it. Like, he can do everything. He can do everything. So, I, like, I like it, Fanta. I'm not sure it's, like, crazy hot, but I'll give it to you. I got a. I might have an even hotter take, and I'm gonna I'm gonna transition us here. I'm gonna take over the hosting duties for a second, Fana, because the next question that you're gonna ask us are two players that were higher on than uh, than the rest of the country, and the guy that I had on that list was Jeremy Roach, and I got some stats for you. I got some facts. They can put together our graphic. Our producer is gonna look really cool when we put this up. So the last ten games of last season, Duke won nine of them before losing in the NCAA tournament. Right? Tyrese Proctor averaged eleven points, four and a half assists, three boards, shot 40 40 uh, percent from three. Right? Jeremy Roach over that same stretch averaged sixteen points, two and a half assists, three and a half rebounds, and shot fifty percent from the floor and thirty eight percent from three. Um, I think that the growth that Jeremy Roach showed at down the stretch of last season had as much to do with one Tyrese Proctor's growth and two Duke turning into a team that everybody uh, kind of picked to make a run in last year's NCAA tournament as much as Tyrese Proctor's development did. Um, I think that I, I'm still on the Tyrese Proctor bandwagon. I still think he's a stud. I still think he's a guy that should be like a top 10 pick all American candidate, but I don't think we're talking enough about how good Jeremy Roach was late last year and how much of an impact he had on the development of Duke's team throughout last season. I think he's going to be a really, really good player this year. And I think that we're underrating the impact that he has in that program. T.O., Come on, back me up on this one, man. Yeah, they, well, they, well, John switched in positions. Jer Jeremy Roach was no longer taking the ball at the floor, and Tyrese Proctor was, and that's when you kind of saw the creativity of Proctor open his game up, and then you got to see Jeremy Roach do what he's best at, and that's getting to the cup, looking for his other, looking for his uh, offense. Like that was a whole. That was what was so encouraging, quite frankly, guys, about John Shire last year was his ability to figure those things out, to pull those triggers uh, on those coaching changes, as far as uh lineups are concerned as far as bringing lively at a different time starting him uh finding different ways to get filipowski the ball like that was what was so encouraging to a lot of us that know hoop like why this six-year extension that he just received is uh, money well spent as far as i'm concerned recruiting continues to be at a high level and he's not afraid to put somebody's butt on the bench which i think is uh, a pretty marquee way to kind of keep things going you have to do things the right way and john's got it going the right way Look, that could be as good of a backcourt duo as any in the country. Knock on wood, you, you hope that they stay healthy and, and that it all it all comes together. All right, more players that were higher on than most. You just heard from Rob. Jeff Goodman, where do you fall with players that you're higher on than everybody else? I'm going to start with Elijah Martin. Uh, of FAU, uh, you know, like, I don't know if this is a hot take. I don't think it is, but I was trying to find some guys that maybe aren't getting quite enough credit. Like Elijah Martin was FAU's best player in the final four last year. He, he had 26 in the loss against San Diego state, 17 against Kansas state. He's just a big time scorer, and he's been hurt. He, he's had a stress reaction. So he's been out. So I, I think he's going to be pivotal how he comes back early in the season Hopefully he doesn't come back too soon. But I think, again, how healthy he is, we're going to see a lot of them. Obviously, we're going down for the Field of 68 uh, Classic Invitational. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, down at FAU. Field of 68 tip-off, man. Come on. Tip-off. Tip-off. Sorry. I, I forgot. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's Elijah your Martin would be number one. <laughs> Do you want both of mine? Would you like both of mine, or, or, or are we going? Go right yeah, ahead, because we're we're at 945, so we got to hit some tempo here. Go all ahead. Right. All right, all right. Tyson Degenhart, the other one. Boise State, 
Uh, big dude, okay. he's from Spokane, which is crazy yep. that Mark Few let him out of Spokane. Uh, he's been all, he had to play out of position last year, so his three point numbers really, really dipped last year, thirty three percent. I expect them to get back because he's going to play more of his natural position as a face up four. Shot forty three percent from three uh, as a freshman, but Degenhart, man, boys, he's just that team. Degenhart, I think, is going to be their dude. And I think he's going to be one of the best players in the country this year. I love that take. Tyson Degenhart can go. Uh, I had a game with that. I had two games with them last year uh, in the Mountain West. And Degenhart, it, he's not the tallest guy, but he's really wide. And he's got pretty quick feet. And Leon just puts him in such good spots. I, I actually tried to pick Degenhart. But then Dagan told me, like, hey, dude, there's too much Dagan on this show. So I just got to throw that well, one out. You got to pick somebody else. <laughs> There's a way too much Dagan. So uh, for my for my two, I guess we're transitioning right over to my two because we got to pick up tempo. I picked Wooga Poplar at Miami, and this is yeah, a guy that uh, Isaiah Wong steps out. He's still going to have Nigel Pack in there. Uh, Norchad Omir is coming back for one more season. Why not? They're getting paid enough down there. But uh, Wooga Poplar is a guy that has kind of been waiting in the wings, and he can really score. Six five six six can shoot, supremely athletic. I think he's a guy that's going to step into that role and uh, be really good for Miami and Coach Laranega down there. And secondly, I stayed in the Mountain West because I was already going Degenhart, Hart, so I figured, well, I just might as well stay there. Uh, Jalen House at New Mexico. Uh, Jalen House is a really good player. He's a lot like his dad, Eddie House, in that he's extremely unorthodox, really long strides, handles the ball kind of high, so he keeps the defense off balance. Uh, he, alongside Jamal Mashburn Jr., that backcourt at New Mexico is going to be one tough cover. And uh, Richard Patino, he's got two guards. He can just let go. I mean, you want to coach him, sure, but at the same time, sometimes the smartest thing you can do is just get the hell out of the way. But Jalen House and Jamal Mashburn Jr., that's exactly what you got to do. New Mexico – at the pit, that place is going to be electric. Is anybody willing to take a flyer on Miami to win the ACC? I got it's him. Not, I'm, not, I'm not quite there. I'm not. I'm not quite there yet. Mostly because I think Duke is the head and shoulders above the rest of the field. But like Miami's really good. North Carolina is really good. We haven't even talked about Virginia yet tonight, but I think that that people are kind of sleeping on the fact that Virginia is also really good. Um, it's yeah, I, I can't I can't get there for Miami yet this season though. Understood. My two players, Bruce Thornton of Ohio State, I think is one. poised yeah. to have a a massive year over his last eight games last season. He scored over 16 points per game and shot 38% from three. He really played at a high level. And Chris Holtman, I think the Buckeyes are, are poised for a turnaround season. That was an outlier year, a really rough season. They were young. They were injured. They had a lot go wrong. And every sign points to Thornton being ready to be a captain for this Ohio State team and really lead them. So that's one that, that comes to my mind. Uh, the other one I – Scan across the country, Judah Mintz could be a guy that when all American honors are rolling in, he, he, he's he got the makings of that. I mean, yep. when you combine his athleticism, and it's it's hard to, T.O., I know you'd have to agree here. Uh, it's yep. hard to come in as a freshman and average 16 and five assists per game and shoot 44% from the floor in the ACC. Uh, the fact that he came back, Red Autry said it. Uh, he was jumping for joy uh, when hmm. Judah Mintz said, I'm coming back to Syracuse. That orange backcourt is dangerous. We've talked about yep. it a couple times, and it feels like Mintz could spring on the scene and be anything he wants to be in the ACC, an all-ACC first-team guy, and a guy that we're talking about when those honorable mentions in the All-America list are coming together. Like I, I really like the the upside there with with all those guys. Yeah, I like Judah. Yeah, I, I just that. want to mention my second guy, uh, Caleb Love. I don't need to go all the way into this again. We talked about it for like five minutes on Monday night, but he was ranked 54th in the Almanac's top 100 list of players, uh, and that is that is just ridiculously low for what I think he'll end up being. And, and um, I mean, Goodman, you could probably attest to this more since you were late for yesterday's show because you were on the phone with Tommy Lloyd. Uh, but I think that the the attitude shift that he's shown this season. 
um, in the preseason and, and, and kind of buying into what uh, what he the, the the idea of being a better teammate. Um, I think he's going to have a fantastic year. I don't know if there is a better shot creator in college basketball than Caleb Love when he's on his game. Sorry that you were. Uh, I like. Response, I like. I like, uh, I like um, a Fanta's pick. Judah Mintz as a potential All American. I think he could get above twenty a game. Let's turn to coaching hot takes. Goodman, fire. I got two good ones. I got two good ones. I'm going to tell you right now. I got a friggin' hot take coming up. All right? My first one isn't scorching, but here's what I'll say. If Chris Beard gets Brandon Murray and Musa Cisse eligible, Old Miss is going to the Sweet 16. Okay? They're going to the Sweet 16. Okay? If, if he doesn't, I think they still get to the NCAA tournament. That's like warm take. That's not like scorching, but that that's hot enough. I mean, look, look at what the guy's done. Obviously, we know what he, Little Rock, he flipped it, got to the tournament right away, beat Purdue. Second year at Texas Tech, got him the turn. I think they went to the Elite Eight second year and, and championship game third year. And then at Texas, his first year, got him, he flipped it and got him the tournament. So that's not crazy. Here's the crazy one. Here's the one. Here's the hot take. After this season, Tony Bennett will retire. Ooh. That's the one. Ooh. 54 wow. years old. Tony wow. Bennett retires after this season because Virginia doesn't have the NIL. Tony Bennett doesn't really love the NIL game. He's won a title. I just I think he's the next Jay Wright. I, I think he's got some Jay Wright in him. He's younger, about five years younger. But I could see Tony Bennett saying, you know what? The hell with this college thing. I'm good. I'm out. I got enough other interests. Maybe I'll even go be an assistant coach on the bench in the NBA. Uh, but I'm good. I'm good with all the changing landscape of college basketball. That is a hot take. That is very I could hot. see it happening, though. I, I, I could see it happening. Like We, we right. talked about this earlier. Did, did, has he... Has he lost yep. his fastball when it comes to doing the things that that Tony Bennett does great, right? Like his whole thing was development and getting guys in his program and turning them from, you know, top 75, top 100 kind of players into fifth-year seniors that were getting drafted like a Malcolm Brogdon. How do you do that now? How do you Harris. do it? Right? Yeah, you know. Kids aren't oh, going to wait anymore. Do it. They're not going to wait. Yeah, so I it's it's a very difficult thing to do. And, and I do think that – if there's the only coach right now that is doing that consistently at a high level, I think is probably Bill Self and being able to get guys to come in and turn them into pros. We saw uh, Dan Hurley do it with one class and win a national title. We'll see if that's something that is that that can continue for multiple classes. If it does, then you got to put him in that same conversation. But um, Scott Drew has resorted a little bit more to the transfer portal than he has in the past because he's had to. Right? It's. Uh, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what happens there. I'm just wondering how long it's going to be before Tony Bennett, um, you mentioned Jay Wright, comes back and starts you know, helping out and coaching some practices. All right. Rob, what's your coaching hot take? My coaching hot take is that Matt Painter is going to uh, shed the legacy of losing to nothing but double-digit seeds and not only make it to the Final Four, not only make it to the national title game, but he's going to win the national title. Zach Eady's going to win the second his back-to-back player of the year, and uh, Matt Painter is going to take over the reins as the new Tony Bennett in uh, in college basketball. The guy that we slept on for so long because his team couldn't get it done uh, in the NCAA tournament was a victim to randomness, um, and they're going to turn around and be one of the greatest stories in college basketball because they were able to get Zach Eady back after the heartbreak and find a way. To, uh, to do what Virginia did in 2019 and go from losing to a 16 seed in the first round of the NCAA tournament to winning a national title. Um, I love paint. I would love to see that happen. I would love to see Zach Eady, who is such a great story and a, a great ambassador for the sport, find a way to be able to get some recognition. And, and it would just be nice. You know, it's 
I, I know that he probably ignores this, but it, it's very annoying to me every time that we say something nice about Purdue when you get 17 uh, Indiana or Michigan State or Michigan or whoever fans in your metro center. Like, but what about those to FDU? What about St. Peter's? Like, yeah. this one, like, Match 78 up. games in the last two regular seasons, man. Come on. Give him the respect yeah. that he deserves, and I hope that he earns it this year in the NCAA tournament. Yep. Not scorching. Not scorching. I, I wouldn't be mad at all if Matt Painter won it. Uh, my hot take, I'm, I'm, I don't think Kenny Payne makes it to Christmas. Like, <laughs> I'm I don't not sure know. that's so hot either. Yeah. He might I don't not know make Kenny it to the end of the show. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that Kenny Pay makes it to Christmas. I, I think there's got to be some point where Louisville fans just throw their hands up and be like, hey, man, like, my goodness, let's let Nolan give it a shot. Because at this point, I mean, I'm willing to try anything. I'm willing to try anything. Uh, there is a lot of hype around this roster coming up. They completely flipped it, and then they lose to <laughs> Kentucky Wesleyan out of nowhere. And Wait a minute. after the game, Hold he's on. Crazy. I'm sorry. We don't have the talent. Look at the graphic here. So, William Gardner. <laughs> William Gardner. <laughs> he, We're going to gloss he, over Hugh Jackson. Billy Gardner. <laughs> William Gardner, Hugh this? Jackson, his way through the 1911-12 Louisville season. He did not win a game. <laughs> How many games do you think he lost? I, do, what is I'm it, Dagan? He lost three games. He went 0-3. <laughs> A tough, tough sled. He, he went all the way to get wins, Willie. Three. <laughs> three William season. Gardner played three games, and Kenny Payne coached 31 and only got four more wins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Hold I on, mean, I'll it's hop, bad. I'm going to the show for a second. Hey, Hold and on, here's the thing, the show too. For a second because I have a better one for you about this. I was doing the research for this. From the years okay. after William Gardner left, right, the team captains coached the team for the next three seasons. They have eight wins. <laughs> They've got four more than Kenny Payne. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, That's the team what... right now, team captains wouldn't be such a bad thing for coaching the team at Louisville. They're, they're just, they're down bad. They're down bad. Yeah, it's tough. And, and the, the, the hard part is, is like, <laughs> like at some point after the game, he was saying, hey, this guy needs two boards. He, I need more rebounds from this guy. He didn't even play in the game. And then he says, well, we're not going to out-talent everybody. Dude, you're Louisville. You're not coaching so some ho-hum place. You're Louisville, who won a national championship not all that long ago. You're Louisville. You're going to out-talent teams. You should out-talent teams. Especially a team picked eighth in their Division II conference. What are we talking about? Uh, here's the thing: uh, it's, it's sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and be like, "Hey, man, it just it just ain't working." It, after everything going down for that to happen, I, I don't. You wouldn't be able to find me for a couple of days. My coaching hot take: There's a coach who enters his fifth year at the helm of this program. His record through the first four years is 40 and 83. His conference record is 18 and 61. And I believe that he will take his program to the NCAA tournament this year out of nowhere. Chris Collins and Northwestern were the surprise of the Big Ten last year. The team out of the Big Ten that makes the tournament and becomes a story like that, Fred Hoiberg and the Nebraska Cornhuskers go dancing. Kase Tominaga. That hot. That's hot. No, I'm on that's the train. Hot. Yeah. I'm on the train. They, I mean, people might not know this. They won nine games in the Big Ten last year, and the last month of the season, they played really well. Really well. They finally found a mojo. They've got a bunch of returning experience back. Hoiberg at Big Ten Media Day, guys, talked about that experience and how it's a totally different vibe from his first four years. And I got to tell you, there's there's one thing for Coach Speak, and trust us, we get a, a crap ton of it during these media days. But I, I sensed a different vein from Hoiberg at Big Ten Media Day. I thought it sounded a lot like Chris Collins last year. They know who they are. They figured out some things last year. They won 
five of six, six of seven at the end of last season and a couple of upsets and a couple of head-turning wins. And I think Tominaga is one of the best players in the Big Ten. Uh, they got a home court atmosphere in Lincoln. The Huskers dance for the first time in a decade. Bull take. All right, Timmy Miles. Right. There's, there's our coach. There's our coaching hot takes. What'd you say? What'd you say, Rob? I said Timmy Miles ain't walking through that door. He's not. <laughs> He's we brought up Tim Miles. Yeah. Neither is there's Doc a Sider. Twitter account. There's a Twitter account dedicated to Tim Miles and and us talking about him. So there you go to that Tim Miles Twitter account. We just mentioned Tim Miles. We love Coach Miles. He is a Field of 68 original. All right, crystal ball time. Okay, we've got March Madness and then your final four, your bold final four. Pull out the crystal ball here. Terrence, I'm starting with you this time. Give us a take that nobody expects tonight, November 1st. That's going to come to life in March. Um, here's one. I like Arizona to make the final four. I think that Caleb Love is going to be efficient, Caleb Love, this year, because Tommy Lloyd's going to crawl his ass if he doesn't. And he has backup off that bench to where he can take him out of the game. Like, and the fact that he has all that and he has some accountability this year, I think it's going to change the way he plays. And that that team already has talent on that roster. And the fact that you have that spurtable score that's now a disciplined spurtable score, that changes the game for Arizona. So that's my hot take team. I'm not sure how quite spicy that is, but I think it's a lot. Uh, I also have Alabama going to the Final Four. We're forgetting about Aaron Estrada and how freaking good he is. And I've heard great things come about it, coming out of Tuscaloosa about how good he's been. Uh, Duke and Purdue. Purdue ends their drought. They're going, they're going to Phoenix. Robert, I agree with you on Arizona, T.O. I have them as the national runner-up losing to Purdue. Um, wow. Your quote earlier about Bob Knight, uh, bench to ass, ass to brain, brain to, to court or whatever it was from Bob Knight is what's going to happen with Caleb Love. If he starts going to, to – if the, the, the inefficient, bad Caleb Love comes out, you got Jaden Bradley and Kylan Boswell right there. That bench is going exactly. to be a great motivator this season. Um, I have Purdue winning it. I have Baylor making the final four. And this is where we need to talk about Vaulted. Vaulted is an app that allows you to participate in daily cash prize pools without an entry fee. It is the place you can store your predictions forever. And by using the Vaulted Challenge feature, you can prove you're smarter than the three co-hosts on the Bold Prediction Show with you. So go download the Vaulted app, V-L-T-E-D, and it's free. And uh, challenge your friends, store your predictions, and join the daily cash prize pools without an entry fee. As you can see on the screen right now, I challenged all three of you to Providence being a Final Four team this year. Do you? My vaulted co-hosts accept my challenge. Hell yeah. I accept it, and uh, I will uh, go against Kimmy English and the Friars to get to the Final Four. In fact, I will go against them to get to the Sweet 16. I might even go against them to get to the NCAA tournament, uh, but I don't want to do that <laughs> until I step foot uh, on November 6th. Now, I'm oh not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not. I'm not. But – but your your prediction of the Final Four is absolutely outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> That's a take. All right. Uh, Jeff, ABC's what's your best conference? Right. So what's my your bold, and I'm going yeah, I'm going bold. Again, I'm keeping going here with this bold, you know, theory. Uh, so mm. my my deal is that Villanova, who I've already said, you know, pretty boldly is is going to win the national title they're going to beat saint mary's and my boy <laughs> alex dukas to win the national title because we both know rob if dukas doesn't get hurt and his back doesn't get locked up danny hurley might not have a ring in his finger right now so villanova beat saint mary's who's got a backcourt of aiden mahaney and augustus marcellonis and you got Dukas and Saxon up front. Dukas, say it, Robert. Say it. 
The Gales are going to the national title game. That's my look. I, I wanna I wanna hate on you for this take so badly, but after hanging out with Aiden Mahaney and Alex Dukas yeah. and Mitchell Saxon at WCC <laughs> Media Day, I'm not gonna do it. I love this team. Like I'm all in on the Gales, man. They're awesome. They're fun. They're great dude. They're I fun. want nothing but the best yeah. to happen for them. They're fun. Great they're thing. hilarious. They're lighthearted. They're uh, right. Dukas was laughing about it. Yeah, the he was making dude. fun of us. He was. <laughs> I'm in on them. Aiden Mahaney you know looks like he's six years old. That's the only problem. <laughs> he does. He so it does. But but it wouldn't shock any of us here if they win the WCC. No, no, no. I mean, and and no. again, I didn't mention. Listen, I mentioned the the talent, the players. What I forgot to mention was I think they have a top ten coach, ball coach, oh, yeah, coaching them in Randy Bennett. I, I really believe that. So I, I don't know how I forgot that, but you've got really good guards. Marcellonis is going to take a jump. Mahaney's going to take a jump. We know that. They got veterans up front. They just need to get a couple other dudes to come along with them. But Randy Bennett will figure that out. Trust me. All right. My bold final four. Yeah. So Arkansas has to be in there because we brought them up earlier. Yeah. First final four trip for the Razorbacks since 1995. I'm going with the team that I think and, and I know – that my DTF co-hosts are supportive of the idea. A team that I think could contend, and and at the end of the Big 12 season, we're sitting there saying, wow, they, they actually have a shot to win the Big 12. The Baylor Bears make the Final Four. I think the, the pieces come to, to play into place for Scott Drew's team. Uh, yep. Love what Jalen Bridges is able to do for this group. I like the additions that they made in the backcourt. And I, I I just think that this is a team that with Jacoby Walter, they've got a group that as as the upside comes to fruition, as the year goes on, I like Scott Drew to find it. I'm, I'm betting down on Scott Drew to, to get something done in March. North Carolina makes my final four for the there reasons we that we've all talked about. Okay. And the last one this has to be a hot take, right? A Patino makes the final four. Oh, I like it. I like it. Yes. His name Richard? is Richard. Yes. Oh His name is Richard. <laughs> yes. I'm going with New Mexico with Jalen House and with Jamal Mashburn Jr. and Nelly Jr. Joseph, the additions they made. New Mexico makes the final four. I love it. They're good. Final four is strong. They're, they're, New Mexico is freaking good. It, that's going to be a fun team to watch. You know what I love about this show today is that we've talked about three teams from the Mountain West, and the Mountain West is going to be really good. I think they can get four it or is. five teams, and we just did the first. I recorded the first Mountain West Insider podcast today, which you should go download. Yeah. You can you can find it in everywhere that you get podcasts for absolutely free. Uh, but we didn't mention San Diego State on any of them. That's how it wouldn't good be a hot take. Because it, well, it wouldn't be a hot take. That's that's the hard part of this show, right? Let's face it. Like a lot of the really good teams are not going to be brought up in this show. Kansas, San Diego State, some of the the top 10-ish teams because, frankly, it's not a hot take if they make it deep. Mm -hmm. This was fun. I mean, What's the hottest take? I got, we one, had more. I got one more hot take. What? Go ahead. Go oh, ahead. boy. Georgia makes the tournament. Yeah, that's, that's warm. That's definitely warm. How, how good? I mean, it, Mike White turning it around that quick. I like Noah Thomason that comes from Niagara. They've got a steal out of Nova Southeastern who won the Division II National Championship last year and RJ Sinahara. They're going to be good. And it's going to be – what Mike White's done at Georgia, which was in dire straits. Like, he, he has gotten it together quick, and they're recruiting at a really high level. they got two top 20 kids over the last, I want to say, 48 hours. So – it's uh, what Mike White and those guys are doing down there is they're turning it around. Can I give right, you what, another what one? Is the, hot, the hottest take, the hottest take on this show tonight was what? It's easy huh. for me. It's easy. Providence yeah, to the Final yeah. Four. No, T.O.'s stupid hot. take about the ACC. It's not true. Yeah, it's not even a hot take. ACC take. Well, well, if Oglesby's got Georgia, he's got Georgia going to the tournament. Terrence Oglesby, 33% of the field of 68 will be from the ACC and SEC this upcoming year. That's well, what you've basically look, that's not that's, that's not even the hottest take. Without a doubt, the hottest take on the show is Jeff Goodman 
picking a program that has been out of the first weekend one time ever to make it to the national championship game. You're just saying that San Diego State's going to happen all over again with St. Mary's making it to the national title. That's the hottest take, and I absolutely love it. I'm in. Let's go. Let's go, Gales. What a all night. Right. What a night. We all appreciate right. you all joining Rest us in peace for our bold take show. What's that? Yeah. Rest in peace There's to the Bob fireworks. And rest in peace to Bob and I. Our thoughts and prayers with the Knight family tonight. We are back with Field of 68 after dark. Tomorrow night, preseason All-Americans will be unveiled on our All-American show. For Terrence Oglesby, for Jeff Goodman, for Rob Doster, for our producer Dagan Hughes, for Trevor Verlees as well. I'm John Fanta. Come back with us tomorrow night, preseason All-Americans. It's going to be good.